Let's see if we have anybody there. Yeah, see. Attendees, you have one at this point. Let's, oh, hi, Christina, Hillary. Let's wait one more minute to see if more people join us. But welcome to the session. We are going to just, yeah, people are just coming in. Sydney, yeah. See, I'm beginning to be a little bit better with the webinar format. <laughs> I can see who is coming in. Um, so guys, we, we will start and I'm not going to, I'm just gonna welcome everybody. Very excited to have the three of you here. So we are so you know far apart and tired at the end of the semester. But then there's these little moments that we come together and it's just totally great. So Jonathan, please, if you could introduce the three, the speakers. I'll be very quiet on the corner here and then I'll join later on. Well, th thanks everyone for being here and thanks for inviting me. Uh, you probably are all aware of uh, one of my favorite things that Marcel Duchamp once said, which is that a guest plus the host equals a ghost. And so I am that ghost. My name is Jonathan Eber and I teach in comparative literature. And I recently uh, helped to found and edit a journal called ASAP, which is the Journal of the Association for the Study of the Arts of the Present. And I feel like I'm just here to um, absorb uh, the other, the sort of wisdom and experience of our two other speakers today. So I'm gonna introduce them. And uh, at the same time, that is uh, one at a time, but I will introduce them simultaneously uh, in sequence. And then Helen will say a little bit about her projects. And then I think um, Emily can go too, and we'll have a chance to uh, brainstorm and reflect as well. So really quickly, our, our other two panelists, uh, Emily Burns is an artist, designer, and curator. She holds a BFA in drawing and painting and an MFA in graphic design from Penn State University. Um, she's recently curated a number of shows, including Linger Still, uh, a solo show of work by Kaveri Reina at the Assembly Room in New York City, a group show called Biophilia at the Unpaved Gallery in California, Zip City uh, at Left Field Gallery in California, and Garden School at the Trestle Gallery in Brooklyn. And what I think the main focus of I'm hoping her contribution today will be to talk about her work as the founding editor and curator of the contemporary art publication Make Magazine, an independent print publication featuring the work of contemporary artists and artist-run projects. She's also the founder and director of the complimentary Make Projects, uh, a new exhibition space in central Pennsylvania. And her, art, her, her own art has been exhibited internationally and throughout the U US, and she's currently an assistant professor here at Penn State. Um, our other panelist uh, is Helen O'Leary. Uh, Helen O'Leary was born in County Wexford, Ireland and received her uh, BFA and MFA at the Art Institute of Chicago. She's been a professor here at Penn State since 1991. And as many of you know, she was recently awarded a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship in Fine Arts, uh, as well as the Rome Prize um, from the American Academy in Rome. And her work is uh, represented in national and international collections. She lives and works <laughs> all over the world, including New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and um, County Wexford in Ireland. And I just wanted to, as a kind of segue, um, and I think one of the inspirations for this particular session is that Helen describes herself as a painter who tells stories um, from the archaeology and ruins of deconstructed materials. And uh, this idea of accumulating and reusing pieces, but also thinking about how those that that practice of reuse and making good with the neat with the necessary um, invests not only the work of creating paintings, but actually the, the work of creating spaces for art to flourish, um, including the DIY museum, which we'll be hearing about today. So anyway, those are those are our two speakers, and um, I just just wanted to hand things over to to Helen first by thinking about how excited I am for this session because it really pushes the idea of sustainability beyond merely the repurposing of materials into the repurposing or purposing of spaces for um, community art, autonomy, um, mutual aid to happen. And I think that both of you really do that kind of work um, quite <laughs> profoundly. So I'm just gonna invite you to kind of weigh in on that question and, and framework. Thank you, Jonathan. That's, you know, I was just thinking while you were talking that I speak to Simone, yourself and Emily, 
so much on the phone talking about these ideas, talking about autonomy, autonomy, talk about when things burn down, how do you build them back up again? And it's a shame we don't have a kitchen table and we're all sitting around it, but this will do. But thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. So um, I'm a, I am a painter, but I'm also autonomy has been something that's been my guiding light. Really, it's been a real lighthouse for me. And the idea of when things don't work for you, like institutions or anything else to to smash them down to the smallest bit possible and then re rebuild them up in a language you can manage. So I'm going to share a screen here, which is always dangerous. I hope I have nothing damning back there. Um, all right. So here we go. So I'll start up here. Sorry about this. So I was thinking of this idea of, of my life as a museum, my studio as a museum. And I saw this sign in Ireland and I loved it. I thought, yeah, um, I wanted I wanted to have a living museum. And I found a place in Jersey City with my partner and um, we wanted to rebuild it completely from trash. You know, we wanted to source everything from our community, but it was extras on building sites, extras side of the road, um, doors that people were throwing out. So about 80% of it was completely repurposed. And it was this idea of just working from waste. Um, we had a storage unit and this is it. It's just, just has everything in it. Um, we had everything, wire, windows. Um, and I started unpicking the house and I realized that I'm really good at unpicking things. I just took it down to the bones. And this was the back area. And I thought this is going to be the museum. And I had this grand, dream of building a museum which would almost be like my work just but built out of other people's trash and this is the finished inside um we found everything on the side we found that in the sidewalk and i finished it like i do in my paintings with you know um the kind of composure of white this is the studio right now and um it came to an abrupt halt right before you know, last March, this was going to be a die bed. I wanted a painting. Uh, I wanted a painting that could be its own house, that could be its own, provide its own color, be its own institution. Um, but we came out here instead. So I was working with Kim Flick, who's you know amazing in this in the sustainable studio, and I started learning how to source my dyes and source my color from local areas. I. I love this image with my palette knife, you know, where I'm, I'm planting my dye beds. And um, I was learning. I, I wanted to get to know my neighborhood. I wanted to know um, my area through walking, through slowness, through growing, through um, that kind of efficiency of, of not going anywhere. And I learned how to make um, lake pigments with Kremer pigments in New York. And this was the color of last summer. This is where I walked and this is what I grew. Um, we go through this real fast. And I, I just work, I work from ruin. I, I work from dilapidation. I work from, um, in a sense, kind of cultural pain. And I, so I, I started driving around Pennsylvania looking for areas that spoiled by industry, um, spoiled by fracking, spoiled by um, oil and centronalia, spoiled by coal. And I collect plants from these areas. So um, I go through them fast. And it became a real lesson in efficiency for me. Even my grounds, like here on the right, it's a um, ground eggshell. And um, I kind of re build myself out of this ruin of my own work through um, a million pieces, really. This idea of fragmenting, uh, unpinning mega narratives. Now, you know, as it came to painting, I, um, I needed to break it down to understand it. So here I'm, I'm going to fly through. These are just the COVID pieces. So this idea of a painting that could be its own museum that could shelve itself, that little image there in the foreground is a crate for one of them, but it's also made out, it's constructed in the same way. It's covered in linen, it's covered in 
chalks and, and um, eggshell, but it, it fits in and protects another piece. And I, I wanted it to fold up. So I was looking at um, people's moving, I was looking at flea markets and museums, how people store things they value, how people look after what they consider vulnerable. Um, and I wanted something handy, you know, I'm looking at wallpapers from the 1930s, how they can, the one man bands and this idea of being a one man band was kind of appealing to me and showing everything, showing all the dirt, showing all the bits, showing all the, um, that, sh that shelf on the left is also a crate. It's covered in um, a silver point ground, which creates shadows. It's kind of a film, old film technique. And just making my own tables. Um, so everything is comes from my local kind of studio environment. So anyway, that's what I was thinking. I thought the next step is the armature around the work, which is the work. So I, I wanted to, to build this museum. So these are just backs and forth. That's um, eggshell on the left, and that's the backs of them. I'm sure, the fronts, they're all the same. And I wanted a painting that could stand up on itself to kind of rethink the support system, rethink the framing system. And, and that's where, you know, that's where the museum, the idea of the DIY museum comes out of like rethinking, um, rethinking everything really. Was that fast enough? <laughs> so that's what I'm doing here. Um, Emily, I'm just going to invite you to 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 leap in whether whether and your choice is whether you just want to comment or whether you'd like to shift to your own projects right now. I'd like, love to hear the latter, but I feel like I can't help but ask Helen some questions before I jump in on on some make stuff. So, um, and Helen, I Helen, it, it might be it might be useful too to explain our relationship. So Helen was one of my professors when I was in undergrad. So was obviously highly influential in um, in my arts education and in life also. <laughs> uh, and I also had the opportunity to interview Helen a couple of years ago for my Project Make magazine. And so um, that, that's, that was a really uh, wonderful opportunity to find out more about her amazing work. And that was at the time, I went back and read the interview today and, and that was at the time when you were just starting the DIY Museum, Helen. So now it's so interesting to see all the progress that you've made. And because we are talking a lot about today, these unreliable support systems. And I thought it was so interesting going back to that previous interview with you, because that has been a theme throughout your life from your childhood is these unreliable support systems, these unreliable truths, all the way back from your childhood. And how does that theme of unre unreliable support structures play a role in in the DIY museum now? And, and how did that create the impetus to, to build this thing? You know, that's a great question. Um, it's absolute, I mean, that's why it's there. I, I want it to be, I want it to be my own logo. Remember when we we're talking about a logo, I want it to be my own, um, that I would be the lender of the work, I would be the, collector of the work um, that it would that each piece would just be a fragment from a life's work and a, a living museum that it it if a piece went to another collection it would be from my collection and this it was kind of funny but it was also this is my life this is my work and that other system is too big for me to navigate you know it's really the kind of um, mega narrative of the museum is too is too huge, and I always kind of insisted on the the role of domesticity, the role of the farm, the role of the garden, the role of being a mother, um, and that was always um, central to my work, really, you know, and the idea that I was making the largest history painting that I could manage, that was memoir, that was the world we live in, and that was very much an invitational to other people. That that this idea of hospitality has been a huge part of my work. That idea of the dinner parties I used to throw here and in Brooklyn and the community that I think we all need. It's only that's 
the center of everything, you know? So that was a place where I could do all of that stuff and I could invite people. I could lend it to people. It could be an artist in residence. It could be all of those things that um, even if it's quite humble, it's a skinny little small house. It's a 600 square foot DIY museum, but it had all kinds of possibilities. And that excited me. You know, that's when I started talking to you about the marvelous things we could build and what it could be and and how it could move, how it, it didn't have to be in one place. It could absolutely, it was fluid. Can I ask a follow-up? Oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, Jonathan, go ahead. Well, if this is a follow-up to your actual, to your previous question, um, and so if it interrupts, uh, I, but I don't think it will, which is, <laughs> Helen, th this talking about unreliable sort, uh, support systems and this dismantling and rebuilding work that is, mm -hmm part of what you do on the, on the level of individual materials as well as this kind of building out of a painting that can be a house, as Emily was mentioning, um, it really strikes me that it's, it's not completely doing away with, the, with some of the aspects of institutions. Um, it's dismantling them into, into particulate matter. Uh, and I think it's really interesting that the word critique literally means that, right? To take something apart and separate it into little bits. And I'm wondering if you have a, I mean, if that's a kind of a statement that makes you uncomfortable or the idea of retaining some of the functions of an institution, even as you're dismantling it and, and making it into a new one. I don't think you can burn it completely down and there's no reason to, but for me, it was, um, it was that, you know, I, I can remember as a child when we didn't know we were poor and how we behaved. Um, in a sense that had all the kind of grace and wonder and dignity of of a family who kind of believed themselves. And I look back and go, oh my God, we were so poor. And it's that sense of belief and autonomy and dignity that I'm trying to have in in what I do. And generosity, hopefully. So that I love I love everything you're saying, Helen. And I was just jotting down some notes so I didn't forget my, my next question. But so you mentioned uh, the idea of memoir um, and you're bringing it back to self-sufficiency. And I know that growing up on a farm, and I also grew up on a farm, <laughs> this idea of self-sufficiency really does get, um, it, it's like in your bones, right? And so the idea of this self-sufficiency of creating everything by your own hand and having to rely on yourself and your community versus the monolithic institution, right? That is kind of impenetrable often to certain groups uh, as, as, a, as a woman um, mm -hmm. and, and, and many other groups find it hard to, to penetrate some of these institutions um, that you're talking about building something where you are totally autonomous. You are the director, you're the founder, you're the curator, you're the artist, you're the community director, you know, you take on all of these roles within this much more small human sort of scale um, museum. And so I was just really curious about um, the idea of that self-sufficiency because it also ties into your work. I feel like your work is so tied in to the museum. It's all kind of, it's all your work. So I was just kind of curious more about the self-sufficiency idea. Yeah, I mean, the paintings have been kind of growing out of themselves forever. I, I, I remember in Rome, I said, if I could make my own staples, I would. And now I'm making my own staples. Um, it is very much how I was raised. It was very much, you know, I, I, I believe that community is absolutely everything. Local community, you know, it's not um, it's not what's over there far away and, and trying to be that. It's really about the community you build where you are. Um, it, that seems so doable and it seems so sensible, sensible that I'm not here wishing I had a million dollars to do a huge installation. It's like, OK, I don't need the leg of that table. I'll use that for now. And uh, we have a saying at home in Ireland where it's one day you're the pigeon and the next day you're the statue. And I think about that a lot, that that one day, you know, you're a table, the next day you're a minimalist painting and the next day you're, you know, the leg of a table. And this idea of wearing so many hats is both, it keeps your ego in check and uh, it is, um, 
I just love that sense that that lack of hierarchy. I love it. I mean, you do it. I'm Emily. Look what you do. You know. Yeah, I do a lot of I do a lot of things. It's 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 very much like I mean, it, in some ways it's a one woman show, but then in other in other ways it's very collaborative, and we work with other people um, within Make to we work with curators, we work with writers, we work with other artist run spaces. Um, we work with a lot of different, we work with a lot of artists, right? But at the end of the day, it's, it comes back to like, I'm, I'm uploading the website, I'm posting social media, I'm writing interviews. And, and only now have, have I sort of started to step back a little bit from doing everything myself, just because uh, scale wise, it just starts to get, it's really, really hard for one person to do all of that and, and run it all the time. But for a very long time, I mean, make, been around since 2015 for the vast majority of that I did absolutely everything myself and only and only more recently have I um, been sharing the, those kinds of duties with other people and and I think it's make has just benefited from that also so that's that's been really uh, interesting to see that change too could Emily could you talk a little bit about the space um, I mean I'd love to hear about the I'm sure everybody else wants to hear about the magazine but um, I think just as, as a way to kind of complement Helen's presentation, maybe the evolution from the kind of virtual space and a, and a, and a print space to a physical space um, that has happened during COVID, as, as I understand it, but I could be wrong. Well, it's, it's really interesting, the evolution of make, it's, it's so funny during COVID because when I started the magazine back in 2015, it was a very different landscape. And now it seems so obvious to have something that would live sort of virtually and defy geographic boundaries and live online and in print and via the mail and, and all these things. And it's so funny to me now because I gave a presentation about make recently and I think everyone thought, well, duh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, no, but you don't understand. We, I was doing this before people were really, you know, on a grand scale thinking that you could work remotely. I mean, mm -hmm. remote work was definitely not something that was easily approved by people in 2015. And, you know, Instagram as an art sort of networking tool was very, very early stages in 2015. And, and so this whole concept seems really obvious now, but at the time when I started it, it, it definitely wasn't. And it was really hard at that point to find other artists, to find community outside of a larger art center um, or city. And I found um, that when, when I started Make, there were a bunch of reasons why I started it. But one reason was that I couldn't afford to live in New York. And I felt like I was being cut off from opportunities in um, the different arts communities that I had created networks in by living in New York and I couldn't live there anymore. And I thought, is this it? Do I have to give up? Or is there another way that community can exist? And so that's kind of how the virtual space existed. Um, but your question's about the physical space. The physical space, oddly enough, began like right before COVID. We finally thought, you know, we've been collaborating with all of these other spaces across the country. And um, wouldn't it be great if we had a space of our own where we could give opportunities to artists instead of having to rely on other um, places to have these shows, we could offer these opportunities, even though we're in State College, which is not a big art center, because of the, um, the value of a virtual presence, we can still give a lot of value and exposure and audience to emerging artists through the space, through the internet, right? Even if people can't see the show in person, they can still see the beautiful installation. They can come for a visit if they're on a road trip. Um, and so that's why we created the space. And then of course, right, right when we were about to have our first show, <laughs> we couldn't do it. So, but we're excited to hopefully um, this summer have our first show finally. <laughs> and I love the one, I was at Yaddo or McDowell or something in 2016. And one of the artists there was so excited because you were interviewing her and she had no idea where you were in the world or anything like that. And I was like, ah, oh, Emily, Emily, fair dues, like, and, you know, I would have to say you're a big influence on me, you know, as that sense of possibility, that sense that you you don't have to be in New York. You don't have to spend that kind of money or have that lifestyle. You know, you don't. And um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I, I really sort of resented the pressure to live in a city because living in a city comes with all kinds of other requirements, right? Well, what if you don't like living in a city? Like, even if you could afford it, what if you like, you know, like I said, I grew up on a farm. I'm used to having green spaces and open space and, and you know, being able to have autonomy in terms of transportation and not have to rely on public transportation. And, and, uh, and, and so being around farm animals and all this stuff. And I just, I just felt, I mean, I love New York. I lived there for a year and it was great. And I go back all the time, but I, I didn't necessarily want to live there hundred percent of the time. And so I loved that it opened up options in that way for me, because that just allowed me to kind of live the life that I wanted to live and have a garden and be outdoors and, and have all of those things, but, and yet still not have to sacrifice um, these opportunities. And we've, we've interviewed so many artists that also live in the middle of nowhere. And so it feels good that they can be part of the conversation. <laughs> well, I think, I think it's yeah. refreshing. Well, I think it's increasingly necessary. It's, it's both refreshing, but also simply the conditions of, of what life is, you know, it's increasingly like, because who can afford to live in a, in a, in a city Right, as, as cities gentrify, or certain kinds of spaces gentrify, so that you know it, it's only certain people, usually <laughs> big budget uh, bankers and consumers, who can really afford to live there. And so the idea of like uh, of what it means to do it yourself uh, not only refers to the actual practice of making work, but actually of the conditions of possibility for making work too. And if you don't mind me continuing that line, I mean, I, I'm a aspiring, um, you know, to, to, to do a version of what you're doing. And so in the spirit of the hospitality that you both embody, I'm wondering if you would feel comfortable talking about some of the, some of the pragmatics um, in, a, in the sense of advice you would give to somebody like me. I'm interested in building a, 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 an art center and bookstore in Belfont, the next town over from State College, which has even less you might say cultural infrastructure. Um, and so what are some of the rules of thumb or some of the kind of life, you know, the, the, the hard scraggly lessons that you've, that you've come away with? Would you mind talking about that a little bit? You know, halfway through the building of that project and Dan did so much of it now, I, I cannot say I, I, I did all of it. I'd have never taken it on. Halfway through it, it was just bigger. It was cheap. It was this, it was that, but my God, it was a huge project. So just do it. Number one, don't worry about all of those things. And number mm -hmm. two, you've got such an incredible network of, of people by, by, by your nature. You're, you're all over the world, you know, with, with your communications with people and your um, conversations with people. It's, it's just a cement and mortar version of that, you know, and, uh, and that's, you've done the work already. The rest is going to be, you know, working with this and working with that and working with how to get your shelves in and how to get it up and going and the, the nuts and bolts of it. But it's, it's like building a symposium, um, tremendous amount of work. You probably would run away if you knew how much work it was, but then it's really fabulous. So it's, it's um, just do it, just do it. And I, I, I'm looking forward to that walkthrough. Yes, me too. That sounds fabulous. I would love if there was something that that close by in Belfont. Then none of us will need to move to the city. We'll have everything we need right here. Exactly. Um, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that finding stability today means that you have to really be inventive about ways to fund and realize projects because you know, the, the honest truth is that it does take money to do stuff. You know, if you're going to print a magazine, you're going to have to pay the printer. If you're going to, you know, have, if you're going to have curators curate issues, you want to compensate them for their time, you know? So unfortunately we do have to fund projects, whatever that means. And, um, our particular model is, is really grassroots. So the artists who apply find enough value in getting their work in front of a curator, um, that even if they're not selected, there's enough value in the low cost entry point that we create um, that there's there, it's a really bottom up, not top down system. So we don't have to wait for funding or grants or hope that someone, you know, 
will, will fund us, we can just keep being funded by the artists who want to take part in, in what we offer. And we try to we try to give something to everyone, even if they're not selected for the particular issue that they're applying for. They're still getting their work in front of a curator. They're still able to have a conversation in, in a certain type of way um, with us and with our network. And I think that that's been a really kind of creative way. I mean, a lot of people use that, a lot of artist run spaces use that model. It's not something we're inventing, but I, I like that model for all those reasons because we don't have to rely on some other uh, bigger institution to fund us. We can kind of be a little more nimble. And I, I mean, I really appreciate both remarks uh, and both both kind of bits of advice because uh, I think being able to pass along the expertise, which is to say the experiential aspect of DIY work of, of founding things, of building things, so that it doesn't become like a, just a brand, I mean, you, you made this as a joke, but just a brand, right? Oh, of course, this is what, this is what Emily does, she builds things. This is what Helen does, she builds things. But rather, it's something actually that can be, that can sort of be part of that hospitality of emanating teaching. It's really teaching other people, right? The, 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 the values, but also the possibilities and the thought processes involved in committing yourself to make you know not to wait around for big funders to come mm -hmm. and you know swoop in and wave a magic wand but rather like get on with it yeah i mean we everything was mostly free if not cheap and it was it was a, it was right after the 2016 election so we would just answer we put up ads in craigslist and we'd answer ads in craigslist and we'd go out and you know it was everybody from all walks of life, everybody from every political um, persuasion. And I would call them my, my, you know, philanthropists that they were part of our DIY museum. And people would write months later going, how are you getting on with that project? That was amazing from all walks of life. And that really was wonderful. But we've done it on a mortgage. We've done it on, you know, we're doing it ourselves. We live in the other buildings, so it's it's where we live. Um, it's handy, you know. I've tried to get grants for it, but it's not far enough along. Um, I I have other projects that make money, and it it it's it's small time, but the, I it was really cheap to buy, and I believe just keeping your costs down was a really huge part of its success. When you do when you DIY stuff, you're you're not paying for your own labor, so that's a big cost saver. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then to your point, Jonathan, too, um, we really like to like in terms of educating others about like how how we've done things, but also how others have done things. I mean, Make has really created at this point a really big archive of knowledge, um, in particular in the artist run kind of category where we've interviewed dozens and dozens of other artist run projects and all of our content, because of our model, all of our content is available online for free. So anybody can go onto the website and read all of these interviews. And, you know, since 2015, we've been interviewing tons and tons of people. And so all of this is just on the website. So it's really created this archive where people can go and access these stories about how these spaces began, what is their philosophy, what's their perspective, um, and, and that hopefully will be accessible for as long as we can keep it up. But uh, I love creating that where there's this place, this archive mm -hmm. online, where people always know that they can go back and find information about either an artist or a project or something that, that always is, is alive there on, on the internet. <laughs> Jonathan, I have a question for you. Do you consider the bookstore to be the tangible space that the journal has as well? It's like the, the mortar version I mean, of that. One of the reasons I was so excited to be part of this conversation is that uh, I heard people talking about administration as an art form. This is Martha Wilson, for example, of Franklin mm -hmm. Furness really thinks about building an institution as an art form, but I had not thought about um, an actual extension of one's work into the space until until this this conversation although of course um, on the phone of course we'd have we'd had a few moments to, to think about that but really this idea of building out a painting right and building out uh, a writing building out a story building out 
one's work uh, into the into the creation of spaces. I mean, that's only recently dawned on me as a possibility, and it's very exciting um, and really and and um, I'd say empowering to, to think that way. It's not like a side hustle. It's not a you know moonlighting. I mean, a second weird unpaid job, <laughs> right? And um, but rather an extension of the work in even the most plastic sense of of that. The it's the work of creation. Um, so not trying to like build up you know administration into something that it doesn't want to be, <laughs> but actually extending the from from the kind of the heart of one's artistic project. That's beautiful. Uh, and so in that regard, I find that's what, I, I mean, that's really infected my thinking transformatively, even in the past hour. And Belfont, it's because you live there, it's because it's close to this community? It's because, it, it, because it's, it's close to this community. Uh, some of the people I've been talking to, much in the same way, you, you know, it's, there's no such thing as a, the self of DIY. Mm -hmm. The you is a, a composite you ultimately, right? right? I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's done with others. And so yeah. it's not a solo, it's not a solipsistic yourself. It is a collective, yeah, it's a collective you know, and community building yourself. So um, there's some folks that I've been talking to who are interested in the, the way that Belfont is situated outside of state, very much outside of state college, but not far. Um, mm -hmm outside of Brush Valley, but not far, um, part of the other ridge, you know, ridges and valleys in the area and a, and a county seat that has certain kinds of infrastructure, but not others. And so, uh, and, and a lot of empty buildings. <laughs> so uh, that's that's part of why uh, that site is emerging as, as really there. But also I, I live here too, and it, I, can, I can walk down the hill too. And that's very important. And this idea of one's life and one's work being so together is has always been almost at the center of my work, really. You know, there's so much. I mean, one of the things that you've both alluded to is is a, is, the, is a certain concept of opportunity cost, uh, what what they call, I guess, in 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 finance, right? So it's the what you can't also do. So you have. To, I mean, um, Emily mentioned this in the sense of like something does eventually scale you out of being able to. Uh, handle everything not not because you don't want to or because it's mm -hmm. beyond your control simply but because it displaces other things and so finding ways to uh integrate seems to be really fundamental to that and so i'd love to hear your thoughts about that same question this is no longer like you know uh alan capro you know, <laughs> the fusion of arts and life kind of thing but rather um a, a much more strategic idea of how you multitask really so that the dining, the, the dining room table is a work table <laughs> and you're building yeah. community and doing community work at the same time and right? you have to be able to sacrifice you know maybe creature comforts for it like I, i'm living in this barn with a hot plate and a dorm fridge and it's fine because i can work in here it's fine it's covid i'm here my garden is my palette i will i will I've, we all have this thing in common which is why we're friends, is that whatever life throws at you, we will make it into something else and make it into something that will work for us, you know? Um, yeah, I just had a quick comment. Um, Helen, when you mentioned the size of the museum, 16, yes. 1600, I was thinking of the session this morning with uh, Rebecca and Sandy about the Thoreau's cabin in Altoona that they built a copy of. And so this idea of autonomy, of having this, this very small, basic, right? Just the table, three chairs, a heater, uh, and how that has been important for the students who built it, for the students who were there in the course. So I was, my question for you would be, I feel what, you know, this idea of the DIY and, and how we are, moving forward with career and research, uh, how does it connect to the university? I mean, you mentioned that Emily has been your student, but do you feel that we are going through a moment that, I don't say style of research is changing, but what it's possible in terms of what we do at the university is also uh, to be reinvented? I think we're in a moment of reinvention, everything. It uh -huh. seems to be, and there's also, we've broken down walls, like there, 
we're talking to people in material science, we're talking to people in um, environmental engineering, you know, th those conversations are happening all across the board. Um, I'm, ho I'm very optimistic that this moment of COVID will change our notions of geography, that will change our notion of disciplines. And um, our, our, you know, we all had a learning curve. We had to learn how to teach through Zoom. We're capable of learning things, you know. So is there another question there? I'm so slow to pick up with the chat. Once. What did you write, uh, John? Oh, I'm just waiting. I'm just wondering if Emily wants to ah, respond to the same okay. question because sure. I think it's. I'd love to hear her answer as well. Oh well, I I was thinking of all, the, and I don't know if this directly answers your question, mm -hmm. but I was just thinking about sort of the sustainability of, like you said, the strategies. How do you strategically, you know, live and do these sort of DOI projects, and how do these all all these things come together in the ecosystem of your life? And I think finding the intersection of where all of your passion and your abilities kind of lie. And I love what Helen just said about breaking down mm. these disciplines, because one of the challenges that I've always faced is I'm an artist and I'm a designer mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm putting them together and I'm <laughs> making stuff happen. And I try not to think about like, well, that's design. Well, that's art. Well, that's that. Like you can't, you know, I just think that's such a killer of creativity. And so I, I love visual art. I love um, designing systems. I love helping people. I love making things. Um, and I love being behind the scenes and being the one who is the connector and the person who puts other people's work out in front of my own. And, and so the intersection of all those things is make, right? And so that's why it's more sustainable for me as a person is because it just fits so well with my personality and my skill set. And I think for you, Jonathan, with your bookstores, if you find that intersection of all those unique skills mm. um, that can all come together and be this living, breathing kind of thing, it is a lot more organic and natural, and it's a lot more sustainable over the long term because it doesn't take a big piece out of your life. It just is your life, if that makes sense. Exactly. No, that, that's great. And I would just say to connect that back to Simone's question about universities, right? I mean, there's things that universities do not know how to do. Uh, they know how to count. <laughs> and they know how to divide, right? But they they don't know they don't necessarily divide things in ways or count things in ways that actually always work. And and so this idea of of you know just kind of getting on and doing stuff autonomously actually is a way to reteach or to teach potentially teach universities about the things that they can't do. Um, and I, you know, otherwise I wouldn't be here, right? I'm, I'm in the different. I'm in a different. I'm in a different unit. I'm, I'm in. I'm in the College of Liberal Liberal Arts, and so the idea of like, oh, but what is your expertise? Are you able to talk to somebody else outside of it? Like, who, you know, who gives a shit? But somebody does, right? And that's the thing. Like, and so this idea of creating spaces where different combinations can happen is something that the university, universities can and can and will <laughs> absorb, right, when it, when it behooves them. But again, it's still good lessons to, to learn a new. Yeah, it is. And it is a little bit humbling, too, because it's not always, it's sometimes uncomfortable. You know, you, you start getting more comfortable with being uncomfortable when you have to, to collaborate or to talk across fields that you don't know that much about, that you have to find a common interest or goal so that you can start engaging, right? Some of it doesn't work. Uh, so it's 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 a, a learning process for me it has been, you know, uh, but uh, totally worth pursuing. I think we do this out of, I don't know, intellectual curiosity, stubbornness, whatever you call it. Uh, we do it. And I think, Helen, you do it even more, you know. Foolishness. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> what is it, you know, that do we have do we have a moment for a question if anybody has yeah, one? Yeah, that'll be nice. We are approaching. Maybe we don't have a question. Yeah. Let me see. If people put up their hands, we can allow them to talk. Oh, Jonathan, you're sounding very. I just I just happened to poke at the right thing. So. Yeah. So good. Oh, we we we're grand. We have till four forty-five. I was. Do we? I was yeah, we have fifteen more. So, no, we're, we're grand. Yeah. If, if, if you are here uh -huh. listening uh, in as an attendee, uh, you're welcome to pose a question to 
um, to the panel. And uh, one of us can turn on your volume so that you can iterate it. You know, when I when I was a young, young student, the um, the idea of an art school that had everything in it, that that it would be without walls and without disciplines and it would like the program I run in Ireland with the liter the English department. That was my ideal place mm -hmm. for learning in my mind was a place where you could learn how to fix a motorbike, you could learn how to write a novel, you could learn how how to do other things and um, I, I keep I walk down to the student farm and back through campus that's my walk for the last year and I'm learning I'll stop to people I'll stop with people and ask them about biofuel I'll stop and ask people about forestry about plants and it's been the open university in an odd kind of closed down way and it's all in front of us but we see walls you know we see walls because everybody's busy and everybody's publishing stuff and everybody's got a deadline and we're all nuts but I I think we we've had time in COVID for breakout rooms like this, you know? That's what drew me initially going back to, you know, going to school as an, as an artist is it versus art school, the university setting. I mean, it has, it has everything. I myself was a, um, my, I had a minor in equine science. So I was in the animal science department. I think, I think to this day, I'm the only BFA with a minor in animal science from Penn state. <laughs> But, but just that idea of, I think it, for me, it comes down to curiosity and it just seems like a lot, many artists and designers are, are innately curious and it doesn't matter if it's necessarily animal science or like all the stuff you were talking about, Helen, the student farm, like there's so much going on at Penn State and I find so much of it so infinitely um, fascinating that I don't really care about the walls, but yeah, the walls do exist. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I wish I wish we as a as a university we could get better at breaking mm -hmm. them down a little bit more. <laughs> Turn reusing them as uh, staples and so forth. Um, <laughs> Emily, just a quick question. As you were talking, um, I, I'm not really familiar with equine scientists, so because um, I, I, most of the scientists I know are human. So, which who are some of the top equines? I'm sorry, it's terrible. I will. I will. <laughs> I, it's been a few years. I don't know if I remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's like, um uh do you i mean this but it, there is a question i think about what does it mean to 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 work within a university versus an open university how to manage questions about prestige right i mean there, do you feel like there's a bit of a little little red hand problem you know where when you're when you're out there you know planting the wheat and people are like, oh, what are you doing out there, weirdo? And then you're like, oh, I want to help. No, oh, no, I'm good. Thank you. And then, of course, when you make the cake, everybody wants it. And but do you feel like that that, that there's a way to manage that that narrative or that the manage that? What uh, the, the other farm animals, as it were? Sorry, that was about like a question about dealing with the prestige problem about like sort of when something's incomplete, they don't rec it does very few people recognize it as such. Yeah, I would say just I mean it's it's very similar to the problem that most artist run type DIY situations have is that no one believes it until it is real or has proven itself. So a lot of times that just takes a really long time, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I felt crazy when I started make no one really thought it was a good idea and in hindsight a lot of people are like telling me emily what a great idea of course you knew from the beginning it was so fabulous and all this appreciation and you just think well i've been doing this for a really long time with like not very much appreciation and i think the same goes for these sort of uh, multidisciplinary things when you're working outside of your discipline or trying something really new there's definitely that lack of prestige where people look at you like you don't know what you're doing. And so you just have to kind of soldier on until you have something that is 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 tangible and then people all jump on board later, just like the little red hen example. <laughs> yeah. That is so true. That's so true. I, I feel I'm at a point in my career where I can do this. It would have been more of an uphill struggle, I think, when I was younger. Uh, but I always had that resentment that when I had an exhibition that it, it wasn't the full work. I, I always thought the full work is here. The full work is right here. 
and it took it took a lot of um talking myself into it saying no no i'm this is, i'm going to do this i'm mm. absolutely going to do this and it might put me in the hole for a couple of years in terms of work in terms of money everything and um i'm really looking forward to going back and getting all the stuff that i can't do like catalogs logos um all the stuff all the language of a museum and i really studied it when i was in rome i'd go to every museum and i'd look at how they held a plate or how they did this or how they fixed something or how they tended and minded and displayed and and um so i'm going to do my version of it you know i have my my showy little pieces being fabricated can't wait <laughs> yeah seriously seriously but you did it when you were younger too though i mean i think that's, that's i want to i want to dispel that there's a myth um there's a myth that like unless you have a trust fund right you can't kind of start out and and do something on your own because you need a real job or you need a steady mm -hmm. steady income or you really you know you and so i feel like no, it's true, it did. You know, when I moved to, to New York and I was old, I was middle-aged. And if you're a female and middle-aged, you're absolutely cursed, you know, it's, it's um, ageism is real, you know, misogyny is real, ageism is real. And I, I got to New York and I didn't know a sinner, you know, I moved from Paris to there. And I decided I would just, I had this, this social media world and I didn't know anybody for real, but I decided to, to learn how to cook and have dinner parties. And I lived in this old loft over a punk, punk bar at age of 49 and <laughs> the floor chick. And I started just collecting tables off the street and made these long, long banquets where at a certain point I had 50 people or 60 people for dinner. And it became a hub. It became a community where conversation could happen, where I could meet New York on my own terms. And it turns out everybody, you know, everybody's lonely. Everybody's looking for community. Everybody. Um, that was that was such a performance piece. I think I did about seven or eight dinners and they were incredible, really. I got to the point where I was like, Jesus, I have to stop this, you know, and then I moved to Jersey City and I knew that would be a very different thing. You wouldn't. It's a different kind of place. You you wouldn't get that. I didn't want to redo that thing. I, I had done the dinner thing. You know, I had I had, I had um, that was done. So yeah, I I have done versions of it all my life. It's true, it is true. But I didn't think logos, and I didn't think all those things, and websites, and uh, um, all the things that I'm thinking with this. Which I think COVID actually illuminated for me that um, you could have a really good website for a place. You could have shows online. You could ha have invitationals. You could do all the stuff that you didn't need to be in one spot so um yeah you're right i have been doing it I, I i did it when i was 10 and i did it when i was 49 moving to new york and hopefully the self-doubt lessens over time i mean that was the biggest challenge for me is not only the doubt that sort of jonathan was talking about but also the self-doubt when you're really young and you're trying to do this thing i mean sometimes you're naive enough to do it <laughs> <laughs> and then other times, you know, you've got enough experience that it gives you the confidence to do it. I'm not sure where on the spectrum I fell when I started, but. <laughs> I always think if it's sort of funny, it'll work. You know, I love telling people when they ask me what I do, I'm like, oh, I run a museum. And there's part of me that's just that seven year old child that's a little impudent, you know. Um, it has to be a good mixture of hope, belief, laughter and hard work hard 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 work you know I, I was looking at those windows that i showed you the finished studio i remember in a storm coming back from teaching driving to jersey city and picking that window out of somebody's garage at 11 o'clock at night on the back road of nowhere and uh thinking i am going to get killed doing this project i'm just going to get killed but um yeah, it takes a certain abandonment. It really does. And he, I couldn't stop it. I couldn't stop it till it was finished. I was absolutely obsessed. That's brilliant. Um, should we do a final plea for any questions from 
attendees and or maybe we should just do a wrap up just, and yeah. ask, you know if you have final thoughts if you brought anything else and interrupt the session it's been wonderful yeah. always wonderful talking to you guys but anything you want to say for me it's about continuum you know just continuing in whatever language comes at you you know and uh i love speaking to everybody here about it because we all have versions of the same you know it's true <laughs> and I just want to make sure also we thank we thank Alex um, Alan for li literally getting us together because it was like uh, making making a, assembling teeth from different people's mouths to get a full <laughs> jaw going here. So thank you, Alex, for, for really for doing that uh, earlier. Thank you all for coming here. It's been so exciting to listen to you all talk. She's still talking. Well, she still you. has a voice, but oh. but she is the woman, guys. I have to say, she's the woman behind this whole. Symbol. I know all my desperate texts. I can't get in. No, everybody <laughs> um, and super. You know, I think you get to know people more when you are under pressure, right? Yeah, it's and, so true. And, and and Alex has been a wonderful colleague to work with, and wonderful under pressure. She's always graceful and generous and amazing. Yeah. You know, oh, you guys. <laughs> oh. yeah, we're gonna well, do a lot of fast when we can get together. You know, I never met yeah. Alex uh, face to face. We started working, you know, already from a distance. Yeah. yeah. Um, Emily and Jonathan, thank you both so much. I love that we thank can so just much. dream out loud and uh, sometimes great. we actually. It's great. And share the, yeah, share the little <laughs> bit of the, the dreaming, the experience. And I'm looking forward to the walkthrough. Yes, yes. By the way. Right. More, more to be continued to be continued to be continued, uh, to be continued. so yes all right yeah. i'm going right. to go feed the okay, parking guys. or something i'm all going right. to go and uh, feed the hens all right well i'll leave the meeting for everybody all right okay i know ciao be well bye bye everyone thanks again bye thank pleasure. you so much bye now